little bit. What do you think about Sunday? Uh, the ark was cut. There's an old song in it, Renee. The ark is coming up the road. I'm singing. I'm shouting. The ark is coming up the road. And, and funny is, after the message, as I thought about it, I appreciate Joseph building the ark and setting that thing up for us like that. But as we move through the next, because my whole purpose was to get the ark to somebody's house. What was his name? Obed Edom. We're going to talk about Obed Edom. Now, sometimes you're born with a name. Sometimes you're born in a place where people think there's nothing good can come from that. That would be Obed from Edom. Okay. As a matter of fact, his hometown, guess where it was? Gath. If you think of Gath, you understand that Goliath was from Gath. So, I mean, it just don't get no better for Obed until that ark got there, that everything shifted and changed. Let's talk tonight, though, about a, a particular scripture that I found, and I found this very interesting in Psalm 24. And if, I, I need your imagination tonight. I need you to go back with me. I want you to think that now David is bringing the ark up the road. And for those that weren't here, let me just mention to you, the ark was, was developed during the time of Sinai. This was the presence of God was inside the ark. Aaron's rod that budded was there. The manna was there. Ten commandments was there. But the big deal was the mercy seat. And that would be like this right here. The mercy seat. That would sit on top. And the angels who touched right here in the middle. Again, we'll have the ark back here this weekend so you can see that. But, but then the angels that were there. And the mercy was important because that's where every year the priest would take the blood of, of, a, of a goat, a, a sheep, and, and you would tell him his sins, and he would take the blood and put it over the mercy seat, and that would give you another year. But it never, you know, it only rolled sins forward. When Jesus died on the cross, the Scripture said the blood was put on the mercy seat in heaven. It washed our sins away. It's for what the word is propitiation. I've got to be careful when I say it, so I say it correctly. Propitiation, it was for our sins that God did this for us, okay? So David, after 20 years of Saul's reign, we know that, that uh, the, the, the Philistines had captured the ark. After they captured the ark, Hophni and Phinehas was killed. Eli fell over backwards, snapped his head when he found out the ark was taken by the Philistines. It was the, it was the absolute physical presence of God. And so they, they, they felt real bad about uh, that, that happening. Phinehas had a daughter. The daughter had a child. The child was named Ichabod, which means the glory of the Lord has departed. Anytime you see the word Ichabod, it means the glory is gone. Don't name your dog that. Don't name your kids that. Don't, you can name your cat that, but don't name anything else that you really like that, okay, because you don't want to name it Ichabod. That's just not a good name. Now, moving on. Now we've got 20 years. As a matter of fact, let's, let's go back to that time. Then they take the ark, and they bring it over to the Philistines. The Philistines take it, and they, they put it in Dagon's temple. Dagon is a great big reptile-type uh, idol the next morning he's on his face big monster of a thing 12 14 feet tall fell over on his face well they pick him up in blindness and the ark is there inside the temple the next morning he's on his face his arms are broke off and his head is snapped which means he has no power he has no strength and out of again they were so uh, blind about it they didn't realize you know with this thing here is powerful we got to get it out of here it's like an atomic bomb so they took it and they moved it into another area when they did the people there were struck with tumors. The original Greek word is, I mean, Hebrew word is roids. We get our word hemorrhoids. Yeah, there you go. That's it, Ken. So they all struck with them. I mean, so bad, it's affected the whole nation, and then rats get turned loose. So now you got, so now they're really scared. They got rats, they, and they've heard about this ark. This ark crossed over the, 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 uh, the Jordan. They, they knew about the presence of God and all of the ten plagues of, of, of Egypt. So they put five golden rats and five golden tumors whatever they look like inside the ark and they sent it in a cart up the road okay so now it's uh, it's going up the road and it gets so far and, and uh and it ends up st uh back in the in the, the the in israel somebody lifted up the lid looked in it 70 men died they got scared and put it up now eli's dad saul becomes king now that saul's king 20 years has passed nobody cares about the presence of god it's amazing how many years you can live without the presence of God. You just go through the formation. You just come to a church with blue pews. Just come in here. Don't mean nothing to you. Just, uh, you know, just come in, smile. But the presence don't mean you. The presence is everything. 
The presence is what changes us. The presence of God is what affects your life and, and turns things around for you. It, it changes your kids and your grandkids. It gives you purpose in life. His presence. Moses said, I don't want to go anywhere unless his presence goes with me. And it's not just that tangible feeling. It's just the absolutely knowing that he'll never leave you nor forsake you, that he's in you, he possesses you now, that greater is he that's inside of you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. In this earthen vessel dwells the power of God. Understanding now this is where he's tabernacling, but then it was in that box. So David goes and gets the box. He brings it up the road. On his way up the road, they put it on a cart because he told him, he said, just go get it, bring it up the cart, but I want the presence of God back. The first principle here in lifting up the glory of God, it's actually overcoming failure, submitting to Scripture. After failing to bring the Ark of Jerusalem back, David researched the Scriptures, 1 Chronicles 15, 1. After David had constructed buildings for himself in the city of David, he prepared a place for the Ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, no one but the Levites, which are the, the worshipers, or the head worshipers, if you would, may carry the Ark of God because the Lord chose them to carry the Ark of the Lord and to minister before Him forever. So now he's studying. He's, trying to, he's going through three months of study to figure out how to get that Ark back because it was a catastrophe of him coming up the road a while ago and everybody dancing. And, and then who died? Uzzah died. Everybody say Uzzah. See, it's important you remember these names. So that way you don't repeat them and you don't name your animal after that, okay? Uh, th th this revelation has enormous application for New Testament believers. David learned that the ark was supposed to be carried by priests, not displayed on an ox cart. The Old Testament priests literally carried the glory of God upon their shoulders. And these specific instructions were a picture of the amazing truth proclaimed to us. This is what we do. We carry the truth wherever we go. But 1 Peter 2, 9 says, We, we are a royal priesthood, declaring the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light so now we're the priests we're the ones lifting him up matter of fact jesus said if i be lifted up i'll draw all men unto me so lift me up just get me lifted up and things will be good so in david's first failed attempt he called a committee meeting now here, here's one of our problems in the church world sometimes we think everybody's opinion matters does that hurt your feelings i hope not because that's what david did he called a meeting, and the Bible says they unanimously, unanimously decided to build a new ox cart for the ark, and, and, and they sponsored a giant party celebrating the defeat of the Philistines. And there is a huge lesson here in this story, again, for us, that God's will is not determined by Robert's rules of order, which simply says the majority can't be wrong. You know, and, that, and it's happened over and over with, with those in the beginning. Uh, uh, you know, the 10 spies, 12 spies went out, 10 spies said we can't take the land. Again, it was majority. So here they were transported in, and it didn't matter how many yay votes the committee received, they were wrong. And God's word has and always is going to be right. The second successful attempt David did, it, he did it God's way. Now listen, the contrast, you have to be sensitive here. The contrast between David's two attempts is startling, how he did it. Watch, while the, the first attempt was a carnival atmosphere, the second was a reverent yet joyful experience. Two totally different ones. The first parade was filled with fanfare. The second was filled with blood. The first one, David come in military-wise, dressed up in his military. The second time he went, he was wearing an ephod, which is just a, a, a cloak, if you would, over whatever. In other words, he looked like just normal people. He, he didn't look like somebody standing out. It, so the, it gives air to the first time, look like it was all about you, David. It was all about your, your victories and all about your winning and all about your successes. This time, he said, now, you know, I'm going to back up and make sure this thing's all about God. Amen? That, that he's the one that's going to get it. So notice how the priest traveled. And we talked about this on Sunday. They took six steps and they sacrificed a bull. I was talking with a preacher today, and I said, I don't know. When I study Obed-Edom, because they took it out of Obed-Edom's house, they brought it to Jerusalem. Some said it was 10 miles. Well, if it was 10 miles and you take six steps and kill something, that's a bloody trail. Now, I'm thinking surely it wasn't that far or he didn't, or they just, you know, did that in the first few steps to realize, okay, God's good with us. Because it's hard to imagine, but, but, but whatever. 2 Samuel 6, 12 says, now King, now King David was told the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom. Everything he has is blessed because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps and sacrificed a bull and a fatted calf, Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. While he was, and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. The, the road to God's glory, 
here is filled with blood. Hebrews 10, 19 says, we enter the most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. You know, the reason we're able to pray is because of what he did on the cross. The reason we're able to ask for forgiveness is what he did on the cross. The reason we're able to stand here today, even come to church, is what he did on the cross. The cross has everything to do. It's the blood of Christ. Now, the second journey to Jerusalem is a blood-stained road of worship, exalting the one true God who delivered Israel from enemies and secures the future success of the nation. At the first parade, David again dressed as king because uh, to acknowledge his military exploits. And by the time of the second attempt, David grew in his appreciation that God does not share his glory with no one. So the king of Israel refused to wear all that royal stuff. Instead, he wore the same linen ephod as a common priest. And the second journey was all about God. Now, Psalm 24 is what hit me. And it's one of my, I, I really liked, I liked the way this psalm reads. And when I read that David wrote this psalm after the entry into Jerusalem, carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Now this psalm made sense to me. Lift up your heads, your gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors. The King of glory may come in. Who is he, the King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Yesterday I had an opportunity. I, in, in the midst of all the things I had to do, I, I watched Robin Hood. The one with, with Russell Crowe in it. I like Russell Crowe, he, especially when he's, when he's beefed up like gladiator looking, you know. Cause he looks so, and, and in the show, every kingdom that they went to face had the gates. They had the kingdom. And then the head was above here is where you stood on the rampart. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But I want you to picture in your mind, David's coming up the road. And he's, as he's coming up the road and he's dancing, he's yelling, Lift up your heads, oh ye gates! The king of glory is coming in. And he wasn't saying him, he was saying him, the box, the glory of God, the presence of God. The in other words, it ain't about me this time. Lift up your heads. Get them up, guys. Lift up the gates. And this is so important. I told you last week, you can't have a gate until you build a wall. So first you got to get a wall around something before you can build a gate. So I started walking through this and looking, who is this? Who is he, the king of glory? It's the Lord Almighty. He's the king of glory. The psalm asks the question, who is he? The answer illustrates the effort to move all attention away from King David and give praise to Almighty God. Who is he, that king? He's the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. To carry the, Lord, uh, uh, to carry the glory of God, you have to treat the sacred with a little reverent sensitivity. So when he came into the place, he was worshiping and he was telling them to lift up the gates it ain't about me I, I'm, I'm dressed like everybody else i'm just a, a one of the priests here we're all royal priests you get this open up and let the king in the gates I, here's a good question don't 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 flash this next slide until i ask the question how many gates in heaven he said four he said one don't, you know you know you're going to miss it because I, I wouldn't ask the question if i thought you knew the answer right because I want to look smart here, correct? I didn't realize it either. I always think about one gate. You know, you always think about the gate where St. Peter's at. You always hear that story and where you're going to meet uh, your, your, your mom, your sister, your dad, like in my case, I think of that. Well, I read it. I read there were 12 gates in heaven. 12. One for each tribe or three on each side, north, south, east, west. Go to the next slide. Go to this. Revelation 21, 13, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates. Twelve gates. So I, I told my wife last night, I said, hon, I'm going, I'm going to beat you to heaven. She said, how's that? And I said, because I'm from the south. You're a Yankee. you got to come in from the north gate. you got to go around to come in. Amen. But I'm going straight up through the south. I'm going, that's how I'm going to get there. When you read the word gates, it literally means an opening, a door, or split. You've you got to be sure not to miss this. Gates represent points of entry. Whoever controls the gates controls what comes in and what goes out of the region. When they were bringing that ark up, it was important for David to yell to the gates and say, lift them gates up, lift them, do them doors up. I want to make sure the king of glory gets all the glory here. The ark is coming up the road. And, and by the way, guys, I'm not going to leave Obed Edom out. I'm going to get back on him on Sunday. But where was Obed? Bet Edom after this. Did you know that he followed that ark? Did you know that he goes to Jerusalem? Did you know that he becomes a gatekeeper there? In other words, he got addicted to the presence of God. He couldn't get away from it, man. He blessed his house, but he said, you know, I'm packing up, baby. I'm going to take a ride up here to, and, and follow this ark in. I got to. He said, it's just something. We'll talk more about that on Sunday. I get excited about it. I get ahead of myself. 
Whoever controls the gates controls what comes in and out. Psalm 127. Verse 4 says, like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with the enemies in the gate. I understand the Hebrew language, the word quiver, there is five. That if you have five children, you're blessed. Some of y'all just gave up a little too quick. Amen. But you've got to understand also, five kids then also had to do with, with produce. It had to do with work in the fields. It had to do, you know, we don't have that much going on today. But I, I got, you know, I ended up with five before it was all over with. And uh, five is a quiver, six is a shiver. You don't want to go into, you don't want to go any further up than that. Uh, the word, the gate, again, gates represent entrance, exit, openings, closings, things you allow or disallow. Everybody here has gates. Your whole life has gates. Your eyes are gates. Your ears are gates. Some of your mouth is a big gate. Amen. We have gates of ways of entry into, into these vessels. So whatever you allow in, things you allow and disallow, things you permit and things you prohibit. Uh, Nehemiah called it the place of defense. You know, the whole issue with Nehemiah was the, the, the gates have burned down. Go, let me go and repair Jerusalem, my home. You know, I, we preached a lot on Nehemiah right after the flood because to us, our gates were down. Our, everything was down. When, when the flood hit out on the property, you know, that 110 acres out there, we were securing it every night. Because anybody could come in and go out. We, and the lights were out. It was dark, you know, so we, you know, we were on patrol. And then I had guys out there after I would be in church. They'd be out there on the grounds with all kind of guns. I'm so glad nobody got hurt. But there, there has to be security there. So place of defense, the gates, the place of public economy. It's the place of public resort. It's the place uh, to have an audience with the king. When you went in to meet with the king, you want to do it at the gate. You met him at the gate. Your house has a door on it. That's your gate to your house. That's where you meet people. They, you know, and you know as I do, there are certain folk you can't let in your house. You stop them right there at the door and you stand there. I, I remember somebody was uh, irate. Not with me, but one of my family members. And they came up to the house, they beat on the door, and they didn't realize I had my 38 stuck right in the back of my pants, and I'm standing right in the door, and I'm saying, you're not coming in. And I didn't mean it mean. I'm just saying, you're not coming in this house. You're not going to. Uh, this is my gate. Amen. This is my defense. This is where I'm going to talk to you. And I don't want to cause any more problems, but you, you slip on out now. All right. So that, that, I think it's important. It's a place that was heavily guarded. It means that to estimate or to think where the wise men made plans, schemed, put things together. Amen. That's where it was always at the gate. The gates where you always found the old white-haired men sitting there playing checkers, drinking RC Colas and Pepsis. Amen. That's at the gate. They're they always talking. Genesis 28, 17, in Jacob's dream, it says this is the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. For many, this here becomes a gate. This is our opening. This is where we learn from heaven. This is where we learned about the king. Amen. All these things work inside the house. Jacob had a dream and said, you know what? The house of God is also a gate into heaven. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, on this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. So there's gates in hell. Woo, hear that. Amen. So, again, the, the gates uh, are, are something that is, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Always there. Uh, tell me I'm missing the word. Uh, the structure is permanent. The permanent gates are. He said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So the church is the moving object. It's the thing that's pressing against it. The function of the gates is to lift up, meaning you can let them down quickly on the enemy if you have to lift it. Amen. That means they were weighty. They were something to them. Lift them up. When I see this figuratively, I think about church life. When I lift my hands before the Lord, it's almost like I'm lifting my gates. But why is that? Because I'm surrendering. Some of you, you don't surrender. You're just... just you just sit there like this during a good worship service, and you just look around, and you know. And believe me, one day you're gonna quit that. One day you're gonna stop that. One day you're gonna let them hands loose, and they're gonna go in the air, and you're gonna say, "God, I surrender all. I give up. I'm just I'm tired of being this way and guarding myself and being overly sensitive that somebody's gonna look at me when I shout or when I work." David, the Bible says, he stripped off that ephod. He danced. His his ex wife got mad at him because he danced before the Lord. He literally just lost abandonment. He said, "You know, I, I don't care what you think. I'll be worse than this if I have to be." I mean, I don't, I don't mind showing my expression. Love, you know, when you really love somebody, it's an outward expression of an inward love. That's what worship is. When you worship something, you're going to express yourself. You can't help it. You've got to express it. The heads, lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. At the top of the gate was a watchtower. 
on the watch side. And again, all, Gladiator, Robin Hood, all of the, uh, all the movies that I, I, I've enjoyed watching that deals with kingdoms and kings and all those things. I, I, I watch the city gates and I see it. And you'll see that there's always a watchtower up there. Matter of fact, there's quite a few of them. But that one watchtower over that door, amen, it's at the top of it. In the watchtower were watchmen. They were observers. They weren't just preachers. They're intercessors. They're praying. I mean, I'm watching The Walking Dead Sunday night, and I realized they had one on top of the wall. So, I mean, they, 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 when I'm reading this like I'm reading Scripture, I'm seeing it everywhere I look. The tower, literally the tower there is the, is the word migdal, which is rostrum, pulpit, or castle. This right here becomes the head in the, in the church here where we're able to speak from. To be or to make large, to advance, to exceed, to increase or magnify. The rostrum is a stage or a platform for, for public speaking. Towers were built to intimidate the invaders from attempting to come in. Now, a watchtower an observatory, especially for military purposes or, 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 or protection. When I was preaching in England, the, you know, our, I like the pulpit here so I can be close to you. Uh, and Sunday's up here because the house is full, same way at the other campus, you know. But I like being down here. In England, I had to go up these spiral staircase, right, up to the top because they read these scriptures and they took them literal. And that you were like a watchtower. You looked down. And I remember I started my sermon up there, Ronnie, but I was on the floor as quick as I could. I run down them steps and hit that floor, Ronnie, because it just, I just again, like being with the people. But if you watch it and see the older churches, you will see that the pulpit, the rostrum, is way up high overlooking the people. Now, it should never be to look down on the people. It should be to watch over the people. That's the whole purpose of it, to be careful with them, to be able to look at them. So when David's coming in, he's yelling at them. The ark is coming up the road. Lift up the gates. Lift them up on your heads. He's telling everybody in that place, hey, you watch what's coming up the road here. We got God's presence coming. And, man, they, I can see the, the celebration and, again, the blood on the road. And everybody knows this is a serious moment. The gates come up. There's a cheering going on. The, the heads are really important here. It represents the gatekeepers. Jesus said this in John chapter 10, verse 1. He said, uh, let me set this before you as plainly as I can. If a person climbs over or through the fence of a sheep pen, instead of going through the gate, you know he's up to no good. He's a sheep rustler. The shepherd walks right up to the gate. The gatekeeper opens the gate to him, and the sheep recognize his voice. He calls his own sheep by the name, and he leads them out. So he said, look, there has to be a gate. I was with a man here uh, uh, Sunday night, he, and he was raised on a ranch. His family owns quite a few thousand acres in New Mexico, right on the Mexico-American border, or right on the border. And he told me, he said, Pastor, my kindergarten ki uh, teacher was murdered by uh, illegals that came across. He said, I know there's this big fight over this wall and stuff, but he said, we need gates. He said, we need walls, we need gates. We need entries and exits so folk can be feeling more. But he said, for all the years that we've been there, we've had murder after murder. people." And it, that, I mean, we still do it here in the States. We still realize that people do this, but this is eliminating something. Or, or preventing something that could, that could happen if we were just wise with it. When Jesus said this, I'm reading, I'm going, come on now. Let me set this straight. This, of course, is out of the message. So even God comes into a city through the gate. He doesn't crawl over. He comes in through the gate. So why should we lift up? And I'll start closing with this. Why should we lift up? Why should we? It, it, we lift up to bring the king in. When I lift my hands, I'm lifting the gates. I'm saying, God, come on in. It's funny how I got a head here. Amen. I'm still over the, over the gates here. So I've got, it's almost like figuratively, here it is. So why should we do it? Who's coming? He's the king of glory. How is he coming? Through the gates and the doors. Why is he coming? Because he's strong and mighty. All through your Bible, it teaches us that God is what we need when we need him. When I'm sick, he's Jehovah Rophe, my healer. When I'm in need of something, he's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. When my heart is troubled, he's Jehovah Shalom, my peace. All through Scripture, he is what you need when you need him. He is, it's not that he's schizophrenic, but there's so much multifaceted things to God to understand. And one of the great things that he is, he's a warrior. He stood before Joshua and said, I'm not for you, against you. I'm here to lead. He meant he was a warrior with a flaming sword. Now, all through Scripture, we see him stepping up as a warrior. And that's what it says here, that he's coming in 
as the king, strong in battle. Exodus 15, known as the Song of Moses. When Moses and the Israelites sang the song to the Lord, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and the rider, he is hurled into the sea. In other words, they made up a song. They, they, they saw a situation. How many know that all good songs came from a situation in your life? All good songs. If I die before I wake, feed Jake. He's been a good dog. You know, every, every song, that was one that just came to mind real quick. But about a good dog. I had to feed my dog before I came here. Uh, so everything that you do has something to do with a good song. And this was the horse and the rider. We actually did, I know for years, somewhere in my life, so we, we sang a song, the horse and the rider is cast into the sea. Now, go back, go, go to the next one here, sis. God opened the door to cross the Red Sea. Lift up your head. Then he closed it on Pharaoh. Came down hard. When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them. But the Israelites walked through the sea onto dry ground. Then Miriam, which is Moses' sister, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her with tambourines and dances. Miriam song, sang the song, Sing to the Lord for his mind exalted. The horse and its rider are hurled into the sea. This is a sign of God being the warrior. Opening the door, closing the door. Somebody said, well, why didn't Pharaoh's army swim? you got to understand, they're wearing buckles and, and, and iron, and, and they're dressed for battle, and they got these chariots, and the horses are way down. And as soon as that water came back over them, they just sank and drowned like anchors going down. Wow. Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. So when David came in that day, he was singing the song. I don't know if he's singing the song. But lift up your heads. Stand with me. Lift up your heads. O ye gates. Go back to that scripture, sis. That in Psalm 24, 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors. When I see the word ancient, you know what I think of? Creaking. Old. Antique. Hey, some of us are like, Need a little Holy Ghost oil on them, you know, to get the arms up again. But God, help me to lift up my arms, to lift up the gates. The King of glory may come in. And this is when you're going to have to shift this thing in your mind. As we walk through this with Obed-Edom, as we bring that ark back in here on Sunday, we get talking more about the blessings of God in his life. I pro in three months, God changed everything in his life financially. In three months, people owed him money, brought him money. What are we saying, Pastor? I'm saying when you get the presence of God in your life and you get serious about him, Watch how quick he changes things. Turns it around like that. His whole, he, and, and to show how important it was, every child and grandchild that Obed-Edom had, he named, had, had him named something about the Lord. He, all, he just connected them to the Lord because he knew God had been good to him. Lift up your heads, O oh, ye gates. Why? The king of glory is coming in. All through scripture, we, we recommended. Lift them up, praise him, bring him in. Invite him in. All of those things. This has to do. Who is he? He's the Lord Almighty. He's the King of glory. Now, it's easy for you to know that, isn't it? But just imagine, for 20 years, the ark of God had not been around. 20 years. Some of you ain't even been saved 20 years. You ain't even known God that long. 20 years, that, that there's been this absolute depravity of the presence of God and then they start bringing him up the road and then a guy gets killed and somebody said well that worked out well anytime as a pastor you try something and something like that happens it really puts a stop to a really good parade you know I mean it, it just and, and I've done some dangerous things I, you know I've, I've had cops chase me to come in on muscle car Sunday you know I, the, the lifestyle I've had uh, and so far so good but I've thought about that one situation how that affected David that he doesn't say that Uzzah was a bad man. He just said he was irreverent when he touched it. Who of us, if not already today, might have been a little irreverent? And then God let us by. So he tried it again. And then he grabbed a quill. And when he's coming, and you got to see it, he's coming up the road. The ark is behind him. Six steps, sacrifice. He's got it going on. He's got his ephod off. He's dancing. And he sees the, the castle ahead, if you would, and the gates of Jerusalem. And he starts yelling, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Swing them open. Who is the king? The king's coming. The king's coming. It's not about me this time. The king's coming. 
May when you go to work tomorrow, the king's coming. When you sing, the, sing, the king's coming. When you change the diapers on them kids, the king's coming. Whatever it is you're doing in life, you realize, God, I want to do this for you and that you get the glory for it. Father, as we stand back and as we diminish in within ourselves, we ask that you increase, that you grow in our lives, that you become larger and larger. God, we magnify you in our praise and our lifestyle and the things that we do. We ask your blessing on those that are watching tonight on HolyWild.tv and those that can't make it here. God, we lift them up to you. Now, I pray the presence of God comes into the life of everybody here and that blessing and prosperity would be upon them. God, your hand would be mighty and there would be a reverence and an understanding of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.